You are listening to the Spent the Rent Podcast. And now, here's your host, Patty Rose. Hello, I am Patty Rose. Welcome to the Spent the Rent Podcast, where we spotlight stories of the underrepresented Lane County. Today, we're delving into the potential changes in immigration policy under President-elect Donald Trump's second term. Immigration is a critical issue that directly affects many in our local community, and to better understand these changes and their implications, we are honored to have with us a seasoned immigration attorney, Abigail Molina. Thank you so much for having us, or for being here. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, before we begin, I want to emphasize the significance of this election, and it's evident that elections have lasting consequences. The coming months could be pretty painful for those of us who saw this election as a potential end to democracy or an attack on women's rights, LGBT rights, and an overall human decency. Uh, that being said, the, pres- the Democratic Party's handling of the Biden nomination, particularly the lack of an actual primary uh, where he refused to debate anyone and his advanced age later leading to his forced decision to step down, coupled with the appointment of Kamala Harris without any input from voters, proved to be a significant challenge for the Democratic Party on November 5th. Many from the Democratic base just did not show up. <clears throat> it could be due to the Biden administration's perceived shortcomings in key areas like economy and, and immigration. Uh, I would like to talk more about economics as as this new administration rolls out, but I figured I would tackle immigration because I think that's the number one issue is economics and immigration. Those are the two issues that, that this election was decided on. So we're going to tackle one today. Regardless, it was a landslide victory. The Democrats find themselves literally pushed out of power by the voters across the nation with the help from decades of misinformation, gerrymandering, and voter intimidation efforts. Nevertheless, Donald Trump emerged victorious winning by a substantial margin and securing victories in every swing state and winning the popular vote. He ran on an aggressive stance against immigrants, even steeping so low to create and push stories about immigrants in Ohio eating pets. Not only was this dangerous rhetoric to that community, it also shows the depths that Trump will go to push his agenda. But you know where I stand on that, and I will never stop talking about it. So lock me up. Uh, On the issue of immigration, for years, the National Democratic Party's disregard for the hardest issues like the border stemmed from their desire to avoid alienating their base. This strategy actually may have contributed to a significant loss of support among the Hispanic vote in 2024. Time will tell a better story of the shift in policy. And I do think simply uh, saying someone is racist has lost its efficacy. Uh, We have to actually address the issues. The Democrats need to continue to be champions for the marginalized, but we need to address the issues that affect the working class and the working poor across the board economically. And I say across the board, I mean across all races and demographic groups, because if we fix the problems for the poor, then the Democrats are going to win elections, Uh, which I feel like Biden and Kamala were doing, but the American voters did not agree. So four more years of Trump. Before we get to immigration policy, is there anything you'd like to add about the election? Wow. That's yeah, a lot. That was a mouthful, sure. <laughs> That's a lot. Well, first of all, I think economy and immigration go together. So we could talk more about that. But um, I feel like the people who voted based on the economy don't understand that the economic impact that mass deportations will have on directly on the economy. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about different areas of immigration. Uh, mass deportation is one. And the reason that I want to separate them into different areas is because when people think there's a lot of different levels of, of immigrant, I'm not ranking the marginalized. I don't want to do that. But we can have a conversation about who has more rights, you know, as a citizen or as somebody seeking asylum or a DACA recipient. And we're going to talk about that, you know, and so uh, because I think that this word immigrant gets thrown around. And then when I say that there are people in our community, they absolutely are people in our community that some of them may have questionable document status or whatnot. And, you know, regardless of laws, these are human beings. And if somebody's being a law abiding citizen and they've been here for a long time, that's a conversation that is not as easy, you know. And so uh, let's start our policy discussion with a fundamental question. What are President Trump's primary priorities in terms of immigration policy during his second term, maybe that would differ from his first term? I think we're going to see more of the same. So this, we're kind of in a unique situation where we saw what he did the first term. We he- we've heard what he's promised for the second term. We know what he could potentially accomplish. Um, so I think it's going to be more of the same, but to a more extreme degree. And now we have Project 25. That's basically a blueprint of how they're going to do it, which I've had a lot of conservatives in my circle, family included, kind of giving poking fun. And we're trying to be lighthearted and we've been respectful to a point. So, I mean, I'm okay with some jabs. But when they're like, see, Project 2025 is nonsense. No, Steve Bannon, the day after the election was like, yep, now we can actually admit that that is the plan. 
And Steve Bannon is running the show. Like, those guys are the ones. This is, it, you, it was, the 20, 2016 election was Fox News that got elected. This is the MAGA podcasts that got elected across the board. So uh, I, I'm going to just continue doing what I'm doing to be a counter argument because it's going to be it's going to be necessary. Yeah. Thank you for so what you, you're doing. You had mentioned mass deportations and enforcement. Trump has pledged to implement the largest mass deportation in history. And this isn't just conspiracy. This is literally what he ran on. Eighty eight. It'll t- it'll cost eighty eight billion dollars uh, uh, estimated, which that's I don't know how they can even figure out that number. Uh while I'm thinking about it, and this is off the point, and I meant to th- talk about this later, but I'm going to say it now. Is it true that asylum seekers, which we'll talk about more later, they pay for all of the costs for meaning? So I've heard people say, like, because I was talking to one of my customers who's a he's a Chinese. Uh, stu- he's trying to get a- asylum and become a citizen because he's spoke publicly online about China's government. And so now he can't go home. And uh, he was telling me that his dues he pays yearly. And he's waiting on on his status being changed. His his attorney is telling him it's going to be twenty thirty, <laughs> and uh, literally, quite literally, and that all of this stuff is going to put a, a, a slowdown on that. We'll talk about that more later. But is it is it true? Or have you ever heard this that that it's actually paid for by those people, like the mm-hmm. the courts and all that stuff? Like people think that taxpayers are paying for this, and yes, there's border security stuff that taxpayers pay for. But a lot of it is paid for by the immigrants. Mm -hmm. USCIS is paid for. It's an agency that's paid for by filing fees. So people who are applying for things, even if they get denied, there's no refunds if you get denied. So people have asylum. They're having to renew a work permit every so often. It was two years. Now it's every five years. Um, So that's probably what he's referring to. Also, like legal fees for hiring attorneys. Um, But it's all user funded. Yeah. And I think and so we're going to talk about asylum seekers in a bit. And so we'll get back to that. But mass deportations, this is going to be uh, this is going to be really ugly and it's going to happen fast. Uh, you know, w- w- what I'm hearing about is ice raids at workplaces. Uh, I don't know. We're going to talk about sanctuary cities. I don't know how they're going to come at sanctuary cities, uh, you know. But what are your ex- expectations as far as uh, what we're going to see within the first 100 days in mass deportation? Mm-hmm. So they're limited logistically what they can do, right? There's only a certain number of detention centers and courts. And if they're following due process, they have to give them their day in court. Um, so I've been saying leading up to elections, like, well, my my thing was like before Trump took office, I was like, there's no way he's winning in 2016. And then when he won, my denial went to like, well, how bad can it really be? And then we saw like how bad it was. And so leading up to these elections, I'm like, okay, guys, you know, he's saying mass deportations, but this is what that would look like. You know, this is what due process looks like. This is the amount of time. This is the resources they'd have to, um, you know, put towards this effort and they just don't have it. We don't have the money, but now they're talking about invoking, invoking the alien enemy act, something like that. 1890 or something. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Which hasn't been used since world war two, but that's a way to jump over due process rights, which are constitutional rights to everybody in the U S regardless of, you know, if you're undocumented or not. So that's the fear is that like, what, to what extent will they do to just jump over all of these things that, are logistics that will cost money. Here's the, so I, I try to have an open mind when I look at, I've tried with this to look at Trump and why the American voters went this direction, you know, because we have to have a, a proper election autopsy in a way that we'll find out, you know, how we can get the message shared differently because I still stand by the fact that the Democrats were going to benefit, the people would benefit more from their policies. I know that with my heart of hearts. And I just think that it's a framing issue right now. Now, my my concern with the way that Trump addresses immigration isn't that he wants to do something. It's that he doesn't make a differentiation between the people that are here legally, (laughs) between the people Mm -hmm. that and then basically casts this shadow of, okay, the brown people have to prove that they're American. White people don't, you know, but the brown people, even the ones that are citizens are going to have to prove that they're American, Mm -hmm. which is what we're going to see. And so and, and that's what we saw in the first administration, which also gives a lease and to a lot of the, the worst of the supporters of Trump to then be extremely vocal about how those people are the second class citizens. And 
So, yeah, I don't know where my question is with that. Yeah, but. I mean, it's like it's the scale, right, of white to dark. And the once the whiter you are, the safer you are. You look at even his wife is an immigrant, right? And she actually worked without authorization. She should have been deported. His now BFF, Elon Musk, was um, undocumented at one point where he, he was working without authorization. Now he's a citizen. He should be one of the ones that they're threatening to denaturalize. But no, he's white. Right. He's he's the BFF. He's not he's not going to be deported. Yeah. Yeah. One of the most discussed uh, aspects of Trump's first term was a push for border security. Do you anticipate a continuation uh, of expansion of the border wall, which in his first term he got about 500 miles of? Uh, and, you know, I don't know where the money's going to come from. I, and that's something Mexico was supposed to pay for it. Right. And that did not happen. <laughs> so I don't understand. I mean, I'm sure that he didn't really push about creating more wall because I think he actually understood that that was not going to happen. It's not, it doesn't work. I think it's proven that it doesn't work. There's 2,000 miles along the U.S.-Mexico border. So he says that they did 500 miles. The truth is is that they did 50 new miles, and they just fixed up the other 450 that was already there. So it's been proven no matter how tall, how wide, how deep, there's where there's a will, there's a way. Right. So it's a ridiculous show and waste of totally. I mean, dollars. That, I, rem- I remember hearing hearing that when something when that was being built i remember someone saying like i don't think that they've heard of ladders or tunnels yeah (laughs) yeah uh now let's shift our focus i I, want to talk about asylum seekers okay asylum seekers are individuals who cross into our country seeking refuge from human rights violations in another nation president trump made significant changes to asylum application and qualification processes during his first term can you discuss these changes and what you anticipate for the upcoming term? I mean, your job as an immigration attorney, this is is one of the ones where I don't think it's the, it, this is where people need to actually understand this. Mm-hmm. An asylum seeker is somebody that's leaving a place that their life is is threatened. And so that is what America is based on. That is mm-hmm. what the Statue of Liberty says on it. Mm-hmm. That's what our country is 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 all about is send me your weak huddled masses. And so that's what there's a history there. That's what we are. That's the only way that we can make up for the what, the the damage that we did to the natives is mm-hmm. actually having this attitude of we're going to actually let everybody prove that they can be part of this. So what what if, what did you see in your first in the, his first term as far as how it made it more difficult for asylum seekers? And what do you expect to see in the second? Mm hmm. Yeah, so these are actually international treaties that we've signed on to, by the way. Like these these are international laws that we are required to accept asylum seekers and give them due process and, you know, see whether or not they meet the the rules to stay here. So even under the Biden administration, we've seen a lot of changes that have been really, really difficult for asylum seekers. Um so it's it's frustrating that you see it from both parties. Um What we saw under the Trump administration was, uh, yes, like a crackdown on the border, but also more so like just case laws, the attorney general, um, you know, overturning like precedent (laughs) cases that supported like domestic violence seekers and, um, you know, same sex marriage um, cases. So a lot of changes, I think, that we we will expect. Um, Who is it that he just appointed for AG? Oh, Matt Gates. Gates, Gates, yeah. yeah. Um, He he probably won't get confirmed, I don't think, but we'll see. Yeah, that'll be a mess, but... um, Yeah, that situation with Matt Gates, real quick, is mm -hmm. is literally he was under investigation by the House, Mm -hmm. which he was a congressman. This is all fact. Mm -hmm. He was under investigation by resigning because he was nominated, which a lot of times people, especially people that don't think that they're going to get confirmed, which there's a lot, there's a good chance that he doesn't get confirmed. I would say 60% chance he doesn't. And uh, so he resigned because that would uh, eliminate the investigation. Right. And then if he does get confirmed, he oversees that investigation, <laughs> which the investigation is for tra- trafficking a 17 year old. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of evidence to it. I mean, this is this is if Hunter. I heard uh, on on Bill Maher's show, he said Matt Gates is if Hunter Biden's laptop was a human being. <laughs> so, so, but you know, it's birds of a feather, right? They all flock together. Yeah. You've got sexual predators just. But see, that's in one flock. Yeah, yeah. This area, Trump has a a lot that are accused and convict. You know, can or at least held liable on civil charges. Um, but yeah, as I don't know, I don't know. I don't know how he's convinced people to, to believe that he's not part of the elite. And I don't know how people that don't have any money or, or anything believe that 
a billionaire like Elon Musk has their best interest in mind, and he's going to oversee the department as this new department that's going to look at uh, government efficiency. Mm -hmm. Two billionaires are going to be the ones that are doing that. But yeah, let's get back to immigration. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but see, that's probably how they're going to pay for all this stuff for mass deportations. They're going to cut everybody's health care, med Medicare, you know, all of the social benefits. That, that's where they're going to find the, the efficiencies. So now you had talked about, I don't know if uh, Elon Musk was here on an H-1B visa, but... A J-1. Is it? He was here on a J-1. Yeah, okay, so ex explain to me... There's a few different types of, of visas for skilled immigrants. Well, is there the one for skilled immigrants is H-1B, correct? Mm -hmm. And explain to me how aggressive immigration policies that are for, I don't want to say unskilled, but for asylum seekers, for people that just came illegally, you know, like that's another thing. That's There's another category, because I'm trying to differentiate these, because there's H-1B visas are for people that come a lot of times it's for coding a lot of it's from it's it's a lot of different skilled jobs tech jobs coming from all over the world so that we can have the best and the brightest at our universities in our you know in our workplaces so they come on visas explain how the first term these people were impacted even though they are the law abiding tax paying you know wealthy citizens that usually get a pass how are their mm -hmm. lives cha challenged yeah so as soon as the economy starts to have issues or the you know the the, the unemployment rate goes up, we blame immigrants. They're stealing our jobs. So there are, there's a cap that's set um, by Congress on how many H-1B visas can be issued each year. There's si currently 60,000 for if you have an undergraduate degree or tw an extra 20,000 if you have a master's degree. So it requires a degree. So these are you know people who are professionals in, um, and are working in the field where they have their degree. Last year, there was 400,000 applicants. There's actually a lottery system because there's such a, a small, a, a low cap on it right now. 400,000 people who potentially could have filled positions that, you know, in my opinion, there's a labor shortage. Um, but according to Americans, there's not. So we keep that capped. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be telling. We don't even want to get into the tariffs and all that stuff. But like, I mean, there's this idea that if you, first of all, <laughs> Immigrants are the backbone of our economy, and there's this idea that if you get rid of them that there's going to be all these more jobs. No, there's going to be less because there's going to be less production that we can make. And and I think that the idea with the tariffs is that we want to bring manufacturing back, mm. but the world has globalized, so the prices that we're used to in 2024 are, are reliant on us trading labor with countries that right. actually have less pay. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly what, unfortunately, that has put us into this position, but we can't go back. Like you literally can't, I mean, it, it, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's going to be interesting, but yeah, I mean, I've, I work on campus. I talk to students all day long. I talk to people that are, are professors that are adjunct professors that are students, uh, underclass or undergrad graduate PhD programs that are international. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are on these visas and a lot of them did have a lot of challenges during you know, basically it brings up these people that already went through the process, paid the money and all that. Then they have to almost prove it again because the next administration wants to sniff their butts, too. Mm -hmm. Do you know? You know, mm -hmm. so. It, yeah. Uh, so we're going to move on to uh, chain migration is the term that is often used. Family based migration, often referred to as chain migration, was a target of criticism during Trump's first term. Uh, his criticism, he criticizes this, this, uh, are there specific legislative efforts or executive actions that we might see aimed in, aimed at limiting this type of migration? And can you kind of explain how this works, how, how mm -hmm. chain migration works or whatever? I don't know the proper term. Uh, we've yeah. heard, we've heard slurs like anchor baby and that I kind of stuff. That. Yeah. Yeah. But just, just to be clear on what we're talking about, mm -hmm. how does chain migration work? Yeah. So again, these are also numbers that are limited by Congress and to the point that there are now backlogs of over 20 years waiting to process through like a U.S. citizen sibling. So he's now talking about limiting. You can currently do for your children, your spouse, your parents um, and your siblings. And he's talking about limiting it just to the nuclear family. So I guess that means like spouse and children under 21. Um, so we'll see. Uh, that would be that would mean a lot of people have already been waiting 10, 15, 20 years would suddenly not have a way to immigrate here. Yeah. Now, this is the really tough part, because there's been a lot of talk about 
if a child is here illegally, which I, I, you're going to have to explain how this happens, mm-hmm. but if a child is here illegally, then there is a potential that we might be seeing, and this was coming from the administration. They're saying, like Stephen Miller talking about how, well, then they're going to be deported. Mm-hmm. Citizens, then, the parents would then be deported. So how does a child become here illegally when the parents are both legal? Does that happen? Mm-hmm. Or is it one parent usually is... is yeah. So sometimes what can happen, like somebody um, maybe marries a U.S. citizen and they're able to um, get a green card that way, but their child is too old or, you know, because there's there's age limitations on that. Um, so maybe in that setting or maybe their child has DACA instead. Um, we can talk about DACA and what yeah, I we will for sure. is going to happen with that. But um, yeah, so you could be looking at like kids who were brought here very young could be deported to a country that they don't even know, a language they don't even speak. Um, it's, yeah, it's pretty crazy, but I would expect more the opposite for kids that were like born here, but their parents are undocumented. What happens then? And Tom Holman's on, you know, video record saying like, well, we don't have to worry about separating families anymore. Tom Holman's, uh, Holman's been, um, tapped as the borders are, yeah, which is so yeah. crazy, yeah. but he was the former director of immigration and customs enforcement. And so he's saying now, like we, we won't have to separate the families. They can all just go back. So you're talking about us citizen children who have rights to be here to be schooled here to have opportunities here but they are going to be forced to leave with their parents yeah and then this is where the hitler stuff i know that a lot of people get mad when people make comparisons to hitler but here's the deal there's fema camps Mm -hmm. that the intention is to rile people up and put them in the camp and then sort it out Mm -hmm. that sounds a lot like like nazi germany i mean i'm not going to wait till they put them in gas chambers to call it out Mm -hmm. you know i'm going to say wait a minute you guys are going down a direction that i think looks a lot like the nazi germany started that's the conversation and i stand by that yep exactly so so, uh you know i mean there's hyperbole is being pushed, but that's not one of them that mm-hmm. I think is hyperbole. I actually think that that's what we're seeing. Yeah, and or it'll potentially, be, it'll be based on color of skin. So, like my husband, who is Mexican but U.S. citizen born, like, will he be picked up, and will we be like all picked up together? Like, sure, and and potentially in some areas because of you know we saw that under the Obama administration, and I want to be clear, it was under Judge Arpaio in Arizona. Obama was the federal lead. Arpaio was running this Arizona county or whatever Mm -hmm. and he started making people have to show papers that Mm -hmm. were american citizens and you know so here's a guy that is like we're gonna it's just proving that there's and they're otherizing Mm. a huge chunk of the population Mm -hmm. now why the hispanic vote sees that and it doesn't bother them i think that they themselves are tired of being otherized and so they've now figured out that they can blame the people that are actually trying to address it, mm-hmm. which is, which is wild. I'm not going to, I mean, people have a right to vote the way that they do and elections have consequences and we'll find that out. But that is something that I'm still trying to figure out too. I keep asking, you know, some, so many of my clients even are pro Trump and I'm like, how and why? And I don't understand it. And I think that there's this like idea, like, well, I did it a certain way or I suffered. So other people should suffer too. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't get it. I don't know. I mean, that's yeah. But uh, yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, is it, do you think that it will be possible though? And we will see uh, a, a parent of a kid or, a, you know, say a, a parent, two parents are here. How does it work? I mean, you had said that it's more likely that the, that the kid would be here legally mm-hmm. and the parents would be here illegally. So do you just, I'm just going to ask it this way. Do you think in this next administration, we will see American citizens deported? You can't deport a U.S. citizen, but what you can do is make it so difficult that the family chooses to leave together. I mean, if if a family has no other resources, nobody else to take care of their kids, like you're going they're going to have to take the kids with them. Yeah. And then go somewhere like I mean, yeah, DACA is what we're going to talk about next. And this is one of the more contentious issues uh, has been the status of DACA recipients. DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Uh, this was uh, a lot of times they're referred to as the dreamers. This was started under Obama uh, because it was for people that that uh, actually I'm just going to tell a story and I'm going to play a song at the end of this episode about how I found out about this. And mm. it's kind of I mean, I'm a pretty versed person, but there's a lot of stuff that I don't know about and I'm constantly learning more. And a lot of stuff just goes under the radar if you're not aware of it. And that's why I do what I do. Well, I'm sitting out back at my barber shop a couple years back. And my friend Ricky, he's been on this podcast. We told the story on this podcast a couple years back. 
So he is sitting there and he's like, today's my birthday. It's March 5th. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. And he's like, yeah, but it's also the end of my, my expiration of my citizenship. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, I'm a dreamer. And I'm like, what's that? And he's, this was like 2016, 2018, mm -hmm. maybe 2016, somewhere in there. And he said, well, Obama started this thing where if you were brought here as an immigrant, as a child, and you were brought here illegally with, with the, or the border, across the border illegally uh, and undocumented or whatnot, and then you grew up here. And so he was brought here when he was 10 years old. And then he went through all of our school district in the 4J school district, graduated from South, has worked as a, uh, you know, worked in cafes, managed cafes, like, you know, worked at Espresso Roma, Cafe mm -hmm. Siena, a lot of these places. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, him and his, his, I'm not going to get into his personal family life, but like even him and his dad have been estranged, estranged at different times. So his dad's who brought him and he's an adult now and his citizenship could be revoked, even though he's been here for like 15, 20 years and doesn't have anything to do with his dad or, you know, last, mm -hmm. I mean, that's not my business, but still, you know, point is, is this is a DACA recipient. This is an, this is our city. This is our neighbor. Mm -hmm. That is somebody that is a good friend of mine. And where's he supposed to go? Like to a country that he doesn't know anyone. Right. You know, and so uh, what did you see for Dreamers? Uh, obviously, Trump didn't wasn't successful in overturning it because mm. I think he tried. He was partly successful. Yeah. And so basically these people had came forward. Uh, Obama pa uh, was like, here's the deal. You come trust us because what we're going to do is you come to us and we're going to give you an ID and we're going to give you a social security number and then we're going to work on it. And and they didn't. I mean, Obama tried, you know, but there's there was checks and balances in our government. Now there's none and it's all going to be Trump's bidding. But uh, yeah, what do you think is going to happen with DACA mm -hmm. recipients? And these are people now that have lived here. These are people that are like in their 30s, mm -hmm. you know, that are living here, that have been here since they were eight. Mm -hmm. So we're talking two decades plus that these are American citizens. So, yeah. What do you expect yeah, to happen? So correction. There? They're not citizens. They're in a status. Deferred action means like you're not here legally, but we're not going to deport you for a period of time. And that period of time is currently two years under Trump. He reduced it to one and then he was forced to um, turn it back to two years. So this is a program that he went directly after, uh, you know, the most vulnerable are the ones that are impacted by bullies, right? Bullies, they don't go after strong people, they go after the vulnerable. And so that's what Trump did. He um, promised to end DACA and he did try to end DACA. What he what ended up happening, of course, it went into litigation in the courts. It's actually still an ongoing case right now. And uh, so only people who already had DACA can renew it. If they um, let it expire for one year, let's say like you're out of work and you can't afford to renew it because it does cost like $500 to renew it every two years. So if you, if you let it expire for more than one year you cannot renew it again and then you're just out of luck anybody who was under 16 when that happened can't get their first one so you're talking about yeah now eight years later they're like mid-20s and they still don't have status right and so it's expired but it's not on their fault they've done everything that they've been asked mm -hmm. and yeah it's crazy <laughs> yeah so i think that he's gonna end it again um and yeah it's ridiculous. Which is so, I mean, this is one that really, really gets to me because people say like, oh, these, they shouldn't have came here illegally. I'm like, dude, they were 10. Or under, like or one, like a two, little kid. Three, yeah. yeah, a little kid. And then, you know, it's like, as we know, you grow up and then your relationship, I mean, you, you leave your parents home. And so. But the saddest part is a lot of them didn't understand that they didn't have status. It wasn't until they were like 16 trying to get a driver's license or get a job that their parents are like, uh, sorry, we got to tell you like how, you know, what your situation is. This is tough because this, you know, it forces people, these draconian policies force people to live in the shadows. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, and look, I'm not okay with the idea of just an open border. I mean, we, we you and me may, may disagree on, no. on, on the level of yeah, how we, we go about it. we have to have security. Yeah, right. You know, I was talking to someone and, and trying to explain it, an international student, and they're like, uh, I, they were like, I don't believe in borders. And I'm like, well, I do. Borders aren't to keep people in or out. They're to keep laws in. Mm -hmm. They're to protect a certain agreement that we have, uh, you know, in this space. And because, uh, I mean, yeah, borders are – people are not illegal, period. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so now sanctuary cities, this is an area I think bigger in the state level. I think Oregon as a whole is a sanctuary state. Uh, and explain what a sanctuary city is, and then mm -hmm. we'll talk a little bit about it. Yeah, so these are kind of a misunderstood phrase because 
immigration is federal law. So it's not like a city can say, ICE, you can't come in here and deport our people. It's not how it works. But what a sanctuary city or state says is that we are not going to actively turn you over to immigration and customs enforcement. We're not going to participate in your deportation. But that doesn't mean that ICE isn't still present in those communities. And what happens is if you do come into contact with law enforcement and you go to jail or you're um, fingerprinted or whatever, you have an ongoing court case, ICE is actively checking those records. And so that's how you come into contact with ICE. And so sanctuary cities, I believe, under the Trump administration, the second time around, he's going to use the states that obviously the West Coast, he's going to use them as an example. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see uh, a threat to cut federal funding. We're going to see a lot of businesses that are maybe not willing to allow the raids or making it more difficult for the feds to come in for the raids. Obviously, you're going to have to let the feds come in. But there's ways that you can, like you said, just not not make it as easy on them. Mm -hmm. And they're going to they're going to make it hard on those people that try to do that. And, uh, you know, that's the thing that I worry the most under in 2016 when he was or maybe may have been 2020. I think it was the 2020 campaign uh, when he was running. There was a push where Trump had said that he thought that Oregon was in play, that he could win Oregon. Mm. And I knew in, of my heart of hearts that he never believed that what he was doing was he wanted to have a rally here. He wanted to get the counter protesters and Antifa riled up. And luckily, after this 2024 election, the people in Portland and uh, Eugene and and across the country, uh, the state of Oregon that are activists of different levels. Some I agree with, some take it too far. Uh, those people haven't been super vocal. And mm -hmm. I don't think that it's going to be silent forever. And I have mixed reasons why I believe that, because I think a lot of them were actually Trump supporters that, <laughs> that were that were causing problems. I'm sure. Uh, and there's a lot of that kind of psyop crap going on. Yeah. Uh, on both sides, I'm sure. But because uh, it's all a show, it's a spectacle. But. I just worry about that. I worry about with sanctuary cities and states that you're going to see this administration literally using them to target, to cause, mm -hmm. to cause uh, reaction. Mm -hmm. And, and we're going to see civil unrest, unrest in this country when, uh, when racial tensions are, are brought back up again. And in 2020, you know, people can blame the black lives matter protests or they can blame the different things. That was the reaction to Donald Trump's policies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and and, you know, the 2020 protests for Black Lives Matter were a reaction to police brutality against uh, African-Americans and just marginalized people in general. And uh, Trump has said that he wants to put an end to uh, police immunity or he wants to give back full immunity to cops, uh, which is essentially saying that all of those pushes that were from the American voices, uh, you know, we're all for naught and that this one man gets to decide. And this is what you guys voted for. So congratulations. But uh, so, uh, yeah. Do you believe that that's true, that Trump will attempt to withhold federal funding from sanctuary cities? I'm sure you do. Yeah. What are the significant uh, legal or political challenges that could limit or shape pr President Trump's immigration plans this time around? Are there even guardrails anymore? <laughs> I mean, he has like the Senate. He has the House. He has the Supreme Court. So. And potentially a couple more Supreme Court seats, which we will be right. talking about. That'll be the end. I yeah. Mean. So, I mean, the, the checks and the balances are disappearing. And the people who have the, I don't know, are brave enough to stand up, I think that those people, their voices are being silenced. So will there be more, you know, my, my question is like, how will people respond to what is coming? Will there be, hopefully there will be, people who are willing to protest, people who are willing to take in immigrants and provide sanctuary to them. Um, we'll see. There will be. I mean, and unfortunately, there will be because, you know, we've seen it with labor laws for decades, you know, centuries. We saw it with, I mean, we've seen it with civil rights. The most effective form of protest is civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. and, and political violence causes nothing. No positive comes from that. Uh, I've been very vocal on this podcast about the line that I believe between political violence, which is hurting another human being and words, words are not violence. I'm a piece. I'm a, I'm not a politically correct uh, person. I'm not somebody that's overly concerned about if somebody gets offended because I think that it's a great big world <laughs> and we can, you know, I mean, I think that you need to have a human decency mm -hmm. and, and whatnot, but I think that there is a place. I mean, I'm a skate rock punk rock kid growing up. I don't really care. I mean, if uh, this I'm offended constantly by people and I just give mind my own business and they can mind their own business, mm -hmm. you know, but 
social media is not real life, you know, you know, and I mean, I deleted my Twitter account. Finally, I'll never call it X, but, uh, so who should individuals reach out to if the citizen, if their citizenship or immigration status is questioned and they feel that their constitutional rights have been violated? Obviously the ACLU is a great, uh, uh, thing that you can reach out to the justice department will not be helpful mm -hmm. just to be clear there is organizations inside of the justice department and as soon as january 20th happens they will not be helpful for four mm -hmm. years at least so there's a lot of organizations like the aclu but who would you say uh people could reach out to if and i'm talking about if their citizenship is is challenged like mm -hmm. you were saying your husband that you know if you are uh latino hispanic or just present like you may look like an immigrant then yeah you're probably going to be challenged and questioned on if you like i said this makes american citizens get otherized and have to prove that they are as as much of a citizen as mm -hmm. as everyone else and yeah. that's why it's wrong it was actually during the first the first trump administration that i started to really respect attorneys and feel like wow you know like uh, what we do in the courts to push back against these things these programs, the you know executive orders that he's going to start issuing day one, like those are all going to go into the courts and be litigated. And so um, the media, even the freedom of the press, as long as we still have freedom of press, like people need to be making these stories known, um, because I think that there right now there's a lot of people saying, oh, he's not going to really do what he said he was going to do. But the more that the word gets out that this is happening it will be believed and people will have to have to make a response. They'll have to have a response. It's going to happen right as he's taking credit for all of the new roads and bridges that are being <laughs> built that under Biden's infrastructure bill, because those things will start, all the funding will start rolling mm -hmm. in and then he'll be like, look, I'm a builder. And so, I mean, it's, you're going to have to cut fight back on that. It's because it, it doesn't come down to who, what party you're in anymore. It matters what news channel you watch. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need more independent media. And that's who they're going to attack. I ironically, though, they are, like I said, the, his whole cabinet is podcasters. And so they're going to be independent media that is now going to say that these independent media like myself, mm -hmm. someone that I make, I bring in about $2,000 in revenue a year and it costs me about $1,800 to do the podcast. So, uh, by the way, donate to the show at strpod.com. Uh, but yeah, they're going to start targeting people like me and I don't care. Like, because the, the thing is, is that I, I've already been, I've already dealt with it a little bit in public where people are like you, but you obviously don't listen because I'm a lot more fair than they are, mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah. Uh, what can citizens do to support those who will be affected by Trump's aggressive immigration policies? Mm -hmm. So this is an area that a lot of times I like to ask whenever I'm talking about stories of the marginalized in our community. Uh, what can citizens do to help? Is there anything that, that citizens can do to help? Uh, you know, it, yeah. I mean, is there, it, it would writing letters, does any of that help? You know, to, mm -hmm. if somebody wants like a, a credibility or a character uh, from their community, uh, you know, like you give basically like when the dude was was publicly it was real public the, the guy was that works at gj's mm -hmm. was deported and they came in and they arrested him at gj's and this guy had lived here for 18 years and he literally pours coffee quicker than anybody i've ever known and then goes back and does whatever he does and then he you know like i'm saying after work he's never caused any problems he's never been in trouble and yeah and then the city came and fought and i think that they actually were able to get him back <laughs> so so i don't know but yeah, i don't remember the end of that I but don't um so we all have a voice and some of us choose to stay silent um but now is the not the time to be silent and if people feel strongly about this they need to use their vo voice either through their vote because i believe that our vote is our voice or literally like speaking out reaching out to your neighbors and, and community, people who are very afraid right now and asking how you can help. Talking to your representatives, making sure that they understand what you uh, believe and what you what is important to you. Um, lots of things that people can be doing right now, but it's going it's, it's going to take time to see like who is actually really supporting. Like here, here's what happened this week, actually. Um, I'm on this thing called TikTok, right? Um, but I'm just kind of getting started and just getting gaining some traction there. And so I put up this little video because we're hiring and it usually takes a while to like get qualified applicants who are bilingual. So I just did this quick video and it got, it, I think it's up to like 80,000 views, like four days later or something like that. I've never had that many views, but all of this outpouring of people that are like, I'm bilingual, I want to help. What can I do to help? So it's encouraging to see that people are feeling like, oh my God, Trump won 
we have to help the immigrants. Like, what can we do to help? Um, so I'm hopeful that that feeling doesn't like just go away, that people feel hopeless, but that people actually do look for ways to support immigrants. This is the thing that's so tough because under in 2020 with Black Lives Matter, there, there's going to be naysayers, there's going to be critics, but there's also going to be the people that just saw what was happening and then saw positive progress and saw people coming together of all colors and coming together and standing united. And you saw a lot of conversations happen. Uh, and I, I say this all the time on the podcast, you never put the onus on the oppressed, but I saw people of color that were much more willing to just be like, say the cringy shit, you white people. I want you to understand this. Mm -hmm. We've, we, and so I really felt like there was an olive branch to the people that were willing to hear it. So it was not ever, the All Lives Matter reaction was, was so funny because it was like, that's the whole point, mm -hmm. is that black people don't feel like they do. So if they don't feel like they do, you don't get to tell them that they do mm -hmm. because they don't feel like they do. So it, 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 it's, we see progress that comes from it. And we've seen a lot of progress in terms of race. I know for me personally, I have struggled with issues of bias because we grew up, I grew up in a very white place. Mm -hmm. And so I have had these uh, implicit bias things pop up constantly and I've addressed it constantly and I continue to and having these conversations and talking to people and listening and, and all that, you know, and one of the issues, I mean, listening is great, but we also have to be willing to, to be heard or mm -hmm. we have to be able to be heard. And so I think that that's what we need to learn from this mm -hmm. is that the people that are speaking, you know, like sometimes there's guys that are like, I don't care if we have racial humor, that's us. That's fine. What bothers them more is, is being, and I'm talking people of color. I'm talking Mexican people will tell me this, that Mexican Americans or, you know, whatever status, but like they will say, I don't mind that humor because that gives us a way to bond. Mm. So there's a time. I'm not saying that it's OK. I'm just saying in certain settings it is, you know, and but that's not at a political rally where you're going to say that Puerto Rico is is garbage. Do you know what I mean? Now, that comedian, mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here and say that I hate that comedian because that wasn't his. He's not running for anything. The politicians that said that he could be there, they're the ones that had bad judgment. Right. That comedian, time and a place. He's a he's an insult comic time and a place. And this election was, was determined in a lot of ways on that aspect that there's people saying that there's no place for that ever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you don't get to decide that in a free society. Yeah. What free speech, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's a really tough yeah. thing. And so even I don't personally, my stepson and I'd argue about this all the time. I don't believe that we can start to tick, you know, free speech is free speech. When you start to regulate what hate speech is, mm -hmm. um, I try to explain to him, like, are you in power? Because you're not going to be the one deciding it. Mm -hmm. So why would you open that door? Yeah. And so that's really tough. And, you know, a lot of people get mad when I say it, when I said about like people making racist jokes. It's true. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I see. I work in a barber shop. It is true that people it's only OK to me when it's in mixed race company mm. and both people are participating and you have to. Act, so it's like really careful in public. Yeah. But it's connection, right? And I think it comes back to what you're saying about othering. Like if we don't know people from other cultures and other races and other experiences and really hear their stories, hear their perspective, we're not going to understand it. And so people who say, yeah, yeah, just deport millions. I don't care. They probably don't know. They don't realize an it. immigrant. Right. And they don't know someone who's going to be impacted, what that's going to really feel like. But the more that we connect and we hear people, that's what it why I feel so passionate about immigrants is because I've been working with them for two and a half decades. And so I hear these stories and I, it's like, you can start to really understand why did somebody leave their country and, you know, many times walk here to the border and ask for asylum. What does that feel like? What is, what did that look like for their family? And what does it feel like now being in a community where they don't speak the language or they're being taken, taken advantage of where they're being told to go back to their country? Um, you know, what, what does that, what does that feel like and look like to them? And when we can really start to like gain some empathy, which I think is probably something that is really lacking in our society in general. But when we can start to do that, then we start seeing they're not others. They're us. Right. And, I, you know, the humor stuff, I don't want to like that can be really t delicate on how you approach it. Because to me, if it's not a good joke, it's not a good joke. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if it's clever, that's a different thing. But when you have these conversations with people where you can actually uh Get, just bond and get to know them. We can learn so much about the world, mm -hmm. you know, because I mean, working on campus and talking to people, international students and stuff, I've had 
some insane conversations about Saudi Arabia with Saudi Arabians that I never thought I would have a chance to have. Mm -hmm. And it was so good. I mean, I had a guy who I cut his hair for six years and in 2021, it was the 20 year anniversary of nine 11. Mm -hmm. He was like, can I ask you something? He said, Mm -hmm. have you ever had like hatred for people like me? And I was like, hatred, no fear. Yes. I would be lying if I said no, because I had to, and he, well, he said, what changed? And I said, once I realized that you as a citizen of these uh, countries that have issues with terrorism, including the U.S., mm-hmm. you know, uh, that you are a victim of it as well, mm-hmm. you know. And he was like, well, of course. And then he's like, also, you know, Saudi Arabia has no state ran terrorism and all these different things, which is true, you know. And uh, I was like, now, have you ever considered joining ISIS? And he was like, sure. And I'm like, what? And he's like, they're really good at their at their recruitment, uh, recruitment mm-hmm. you know. And, he, and I was like, what was it that changed for you. And he was like, they would preach about not smoking cigarettes, not having premarital sex with women, uh, or just being a debauchery in any way. Uh, just all these, these really strong, hard, hardcore stances that, you know, are pretty unlikely for someone in their (laughs) twenties. And I was just like, so, you know, so so what happens? He's like, well, they're not, they don't live like that. They're hypocrites. Mm. And then I'm like, well, thank God, you know, because if, I mean, if, you know, we get these Puritans in the world that are, steadfast on killing people that's probably not going to be too great that's how you get the dark ages but but, but uh, it's that radicalism right it's, yeah it's it's everywhere it's not just it's with everywhere Muslim. and it's now happening it's with the liberalism it's American. happening with conservatism it's happening with uh, islam it's happening with christianity <laughs> you know it's happening everywhere and i think that you know like my partner and i were talking yesterday about how it's really important to us for us to admit our biases and admit that we mm-hmm. ourselves have these things that we see that we are critical of. And then it like when I've had those conversations with people of different races and I'm like, I'm just honest and I'm like, yeah, dude, I've had like super ignorant thoughts. They're like, me too. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, and then it's like, we get through things. Because we all have our experience. Yeah, and like I had same. one experience with a black person. And so now I'm going to say that that applies to every black person that I meet. Like, totally. That's how it works. I mean, I had a, one of the best lessons when it comes to race. I was talking to my friend, Jason English. And I said, or sorry, it was uh, Jason Floyd. And I said, I was like, what do black people think about this? He goes, I don't know. Why don't you ask them? Every one of them, dude. We all think different shit. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So is there anything you want to add before we get out of here? Uh, First, I want to thank you, you know, for shedding light on these important questions. In Lane County and across the nation, these policies will have profound impact on our neighbors, friends, and communities. Uh, Is there anything that you'd like to add about immigration uh, you know, you are an immigration attorney. Like I said, Abigail Molina, if anybody is needs your services, they can find you on the socials. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of things that you offer. I'm sure consultations free, yep. you know, so for anybody that wants to reach out, there's that, but just in general, what is it that you want people to be paying attention to? Or is there anything else you want to add before you get out of here? We're telling people to make informed decisions. So there's a lot of fear right now. And a lot of people are just like going to make knee jerk reactions to one, once things start happening, but we're encouraging people to make a plan, have a strategy. If this happens, we'll do that. You know, even in my own family, we're making plans and um, contingency plans based on whatever happens. So, Um, that's really important. And I feel like it helps manage the fear and the anxiety too. It gives us a little bit of control over our situation when we feel like we're out of control. For sure. Yeah. And I'm just taking it day by day. I mean, I just hope we survive this and I think we will, you know, because I believe in our country and I, I think if we survive 2016, that's what I told, I called my dad the day before the election and my dad and I are on different views, but I said, dad, we survived 2016. We survived Obama or, uh, Trump and we survived Biden. So both of us can probably calm down a little bit. And I was just trying to like keep the peace. And there's a lot of that too. There's a lot of negativity in the world, but there's also a lot of people that are willing to bite their tongue mm-hmm. sometimes. And I want to give credit to that, to the people that understand that there's Thanksgiving is not the right setting, mm-hmm. you know, and that you can love someone even if you disagree with them, but you can't, I, I won't love someone that, that what I disagree with on is if, if brown people are equal, you mm-hmm. know, and stuff like that. I, I'm, I'm going to draw the line. Like, I don't care if you're a racist. I'm an anti-racist. There's only two parties. And I refuse to, to, to budge on that. That if you're not working to combat racism, then you're a part of the problem. Mm-hmm. And it's that simple. So, uh, so yeah, <laughs> on, that, on that note, uh, Abigail Molina, uh, thank well, you so much. Uh, you know, it's been, it's been a treat. Your family is awesome for our community. Uh, to our listeners, thank you for t- tuning into this episode of the Spent the Rent podcast, where we shed light on the stories of the individuals who are often unheard.
was a ten year old who only did what he was told. He slept in Mexico, he had no idea where his journey would go. Left behind all of his familia, tried only to incorporate a feeling of ownership over residence, regardless of the president. Push to ostracize his chances at citizenship. Ownership over residence, regardless of the president. Push to ostracize his chances at citizenship. Some say I'm a dreamer. Honestamente, let's relate first. No desprecian como gente. Get called names like thieves or aliens, even rapists. But I see here no conviction. Solamente hago breakfast. Work at a cafe, cocino, desayuno como cualquier alguno. Like everybody else, we pay taxes. Work most days, a veces sin a break. Who can relate? Quien entiende? Hey. Some say that I'm a dreamer. The stars and bars. It's hard to take away the right to live where you are. Only home you've ever known is promised by your whereabouts, and this is why we shout. Once tasted is the freedom of the stars and bars. It's hard to take away the right to live where you are. Only home you've ever known is promised by your whereabouts, and this is why we shout. Sunset.